So I'm really glad you could get here. It was good to see you at that party. We had a good old time. It was right a fabulous. Wee hours, it was yeah. a fabulous party, and yeah. I don't think I've been to many 12-hour parties. <laughs> I know they didn't it leave till 8:30 in the morning, but it was good. I, it makes me feel like an early leaver. I left at quarter of eight. Yeah, I know. I I know the feeling very well. But anyway, it was good, and it's really good to see you. We've got a lot to talk. I'm very impressed with your resume, and it's good. And uh, welcome, welcome very, very much to the conversation. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Ed, Edwin, Edmund Allen Voyer, and he is a, a senior sales executive with 25 years of experience at major ma financial institutions consulting with them, and he has a, a, a very interesting take on the human condition, and particularly from the standpoint of understanding economics and so forth. We're going to be talking about matters of great concern to the operation of the whole planet, I would suggest. And uh, Edmund, welcome really very, very much to the conversation. Well, Great pleasure to see you here on the set. Thank you, Harold. It's a delight to be here. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can say you're, you're an icon. We are veterans of a really wild holiday season party. We, uh, we that got as through well. the whole thing together, yeah. Uh, some of us gained a little more than <laughs> others, but yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a delight to be here. It's uh, good to have an opportunity to express some views. Well, welcome to Public Access and Manhattan Network. I wonder if you could, we're going to be talking about a number of things you provided me with information and so forth, all of which is interesting, but could you share just in a brief kind of way your own background, born and raised, education, a little of that, and then let we can talk some about the, the national economy, finance questions in terms of that, maybe it touched considerably on Social Security Good. and that sort of thing, but share your own background, please. Terrific, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Manhattan, mm -hmm. but I was raised in New Jersey in a small town called South Orange, mm -hmm, yeah. and uh, had a nice life. I went to Morristown Baird School, Drew University, and for my master's in finance and marketing, Fordham University here in the city. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, <coughs> I started off my career as a stockbroker. Uh, I'm sorry. Prior to starting as a stockbroker, I was an economist, and I worked in the auto industry and. Uh, I had to forecast it at the time. Everyone thought the uh, American industry was going to collapse uh -huh. and that the Japanese would run around with 60 or 70 percent of the U.S. market. What percentage do they have now? Oh, perhaps 40. Okay. Big difference between 40 and 60. It's a massive difference yeah, and it uh -huh. means that we in the U.S. are still viable. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, you may have read in the paper just the other day that mm -hmm. Ford despite all of its travails, is still the number two auto manufacturer in the world. Okay, I, I did not see that, but that's interesting. I'm from Detroit, and ah. I was raised in Detroit, so I'm very familiar with the importance of the auto industry, which was... From what I read, Toyota's nip and tuck number two, mm -hmm. uh, fighting with Ford. You know, uh -huh. We're talking just a few thousand cars at this point. Mm -hmm. However, that's natural as a co an economy globalizes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can't be number one in every industry mm -hmm. across the board. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you, you 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 said you study economics. Did you study theoretical economics, or were you I, being I more on the practical <sighs> side of uh, running a business sort of thing? Or well, in, in there's in a lot of variations in terms of what you would have been concerned with. In the I'm a economics. I'm a liberal arts major, so okay. uh, <laughs> so that meant uh, nothing practical, all theoretical. Really? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did have to take in, in towards the senior year things like quantitative analysis, uh -huh. but really the concentrations were more on the theory. On theory. So, I mean, if I may, would, would that include such things, let's say, begin with Mr. Smith and Mr. Ricardo and Mr. Marks Abs and Mr. Keynes and absolutely. all that sort of thing? Absolutely. Okay, that's something that I'm interested in in a layman's way. I've not studied it, but I'm interested in that, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. We, we, uh, in fact, economics, like the joke goes, 101 starts with starts with Mr. Smith, or Mr. Smith and yeah. uh, works its way up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, it's odd that we live in an age where Malthus, who was very negative and spoke about supplies ending and the world being doomed and the world being unable to support a population above a quarter billion, mm -hmm. uh, still reigns supreme here spiritually. You think it does? I yeah. think do you, that you think we have a lot of neo-Malthusians, right? Uh, sadly, you know, no, uh -huh. this is going to be in the Wall Street Journal this week. They've been writing about uh, IQ and uh -huh. how we have to remember that the average IQ is 100. I know that's a true fact. Yeah. And that means, but we're also a, a democratic republic. Uh -huh. Everyone has an opinion, uh -huh. and sometimes it's hard for people to 
get away from things that appear self-evident but aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the hardest one is that Malthusian single pie syndrome. Uh, that zero sum. Exactly. Mm -hmm. this, there's only one pie and you keep cutting the slices thinner and thinner and thinner. Let me begin you beginning then, let's say economics. It's okay. extremely important and it seems from my perspective economic theory or an understanding informs mightily the political and the business and the social and economic organization of the society and uh, I wonder if you agree with that general principle I and it's not nearly well enough understood the basics of economic and economic theory as it should be bec in view of its extreme importance in terms of structuring human society. I, I totally 100 percent agree with that thought mm -hmm. and, and it's both uh, a real problem globally not mm -hmm. just in the United States. Oh yes. Uh, I'd even say Europe suffers more from Malthusian thought than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're structuring their government in such a way that they can prove that Malthus works mm -hmm. uh, by slowing their growth. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it even stems from, was it Nixon who said, uh, we can now say that everyone is a Keynesian. He said 1972, we're all Keynesians now. And I would like to ask you, with your very understanding, what are we all now? What is the basic theory by which we and the political classes and the intellectual classes inform the political process? What is the theory? Is it Mr. This Friedman? Is, this is going is to be Mr. exactly. This is this is going is to be Mr. Hayek. Who is informing, uh, in from an intellectual theoretical basis? This is going to be the equivalent of of, uh, of dress British, think Yiddish, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and it's it's talk, it's talk Keynes think or or, or, or it's it's think Keynes uh -huh. talk Friedman. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Again, Friedman's a little complex for most people, mm -hmm. and the Chicago School of Economics, you know is relatively new. It's mm -hmm. less than 50 years old. Monetarists. Monetarists and uh, the opposite of zero-sum game. They uh -huh. think you can grow that pie and make more pies. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. think it's an entire pizzeria where they just throw <laughs> pies out and spew <laughs> them out. And yeah. in, in the countries where it's been tried, like mm -hmm. Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, Chile, to a lesser extent the United States, mm -hmm. they've been proven right, I think. Mm -hmm. when, when we say um, Okay, uh, let, maybe we begin with the primer of uh, basic. And I be, uh, I've seen in a dictionary economics uh, the, sci the science or the study of the allocation of scarce resources. Or the dismal science. Well, it's been called that, yeah, but it's called that. I'm forget who said that. I forget who that was. But <laughs> anyway, but the idea of it's dealing with the assumption of scarcity. Now, I associate zero sum with a pie that is only so big and you have to divide it up instead of the idea that non-zero sum or post-zero sum is something beginning to get away to where there is more than we thought might be possible by growth and other kinds of things and that this is a very important kind of transformation that's happening in the experience but the idea of the allocation of scarce resources and is it naive to think that we could ever transcend in terms of our capability the assumption of scarcity or is that Impossible no, to it's, conceive. It's it's uh, humanly impossible to conceive, and in fact, we have a dreadful scarcity of buggy whips. Yes, we and do. And we have a dreadful scarcity of corsets. No. And whale oil is an extraordinarily short supply. It is indeed. Yeah. And we don't. You can get low on kerosene in the shed. Uh, well, you can, but uh. they still make that. Yeah, if they there still. Was a demand. still there. I think it's called uh, jet fuel. The vast majority of the species that ever existed are extinct. That is true, yeah. and yet there's more per there's more more living beings on the planet than ever before. Well, I know it's a, it's an interesting thing, but the idea of scarcity is then uh, that that's something that um, is something that is is there enough or let's say in terms of capability. Is there a difference between a situation where you're trying to figure out how you're going to distribute one hot dog to ten people and you're going to distribute ten hot dogs to ten people? There's well, a different way of thinking. Yes, absolutely. And, and that, that, that the possibility of there being ten, twelve, fifteen hot dogs for ten people yeah. is something that's emerging and is something that's part of the context. 
that doesn't fit into any of the while, while, definitions while, of economics. I'll, I'll use hot dogs as an example while there is no shortage of hot dogs. Yeah, right. Uh, seems there's plenty of junk meat throughout the United States. Apparently, yeah. But, uh, sure, an all-beef, 100% pure hot dog might be in short supply, mm -hmm. so they add, they start making pork hot dogs, uh -huh. and then chicken, chicken hot dogs. Turkey. Turkey hot dogs. Mm -hmm. Tofu hot dogs. Tofu, you can go a million ways. Uh, you can go forever for it, except for the taste. Uh -huh. uh, well, the personal income, as you can tell, I don't eat enough tofu <laughs> hot dogs. Mm. But, uh, you know, right there you've said it all. Uh -huh. uh, you just start making different variants and versions of hot dogs. Okay, but the idea of there being enough. Uh, um, my, one of my heroes, if I met Buckminster Fuller, was a comp polymath, comprehensivist, and he took a thing called World Game, it was sort of out of the war game, you know, Red Clauses kind of stuff and everything, and he developed World Game, which is a way of understanding all trends, human trends and so forth, from a non-ideological perspective and so forth, and he had a chart, a famous chart that he copyrighted in 1952, and his assumption was that through time, we've been here, t he thought millions, we've been here 200,000 years, and through time, there's been a technological capability to provide life support and that sort of thing that's evolved with the, with the situation. Mr. Smith har was a harbinger of the Industrial Revolution that was coming and so forth. But, and he said that uh, the percentage, and he worked out a chart and a graph of haves and have-nots. That's a big thing that we've talked about through history, that there's a certain, certain percentage of the world population on a, on a system scale, that's taking everything into account that could be seen realistically within criteria that have to be defined as haves and those that were have-nots. And then another thing is between capability and between the actual reality. And he said throughout history, we're coming out of history and it was always just only a very few that were in the palaces and whatnot. And he said that we came out into the 20th century and it, by the First World War it got to be on his reckoning, and this non-ideologic leader, Approximately 10% of the world population could be seen to be halves by, 19, by the First World War. He said by the Second World War, that thing is going and the chart's going like this, and 20% were able to be seen to be halves by the, the Second World War with the technological advances. And in 1952, he, he, he copyrighted a chart, and he said we had a 20-year period of imminent crisis because that line was going up like this. And he said that by the end of the uh, 20 years out from 1952, roughly, we would reach the point where 50% of the world population could be seen to be halves in terms of our abstract, <sighs> evolving technological capability of providing life support. And he lived out his life saying in the belief that we crossed the 50% mark around the year 1970. Now, is that all impossible to conceive of no, in, uh, in no. anything? Or, and then he's, that we're he's, per he's dead on. That the timing might be off. In dead other words, on. But well, there, he's dead on I, accurate, I let think. Me, let me just suggest, if that is the case, we were, in an ontologic sense or in a large system sense, we were transcending scarcity in an ontologic sense. Yes, we were. Uh, uh -huh. uh, now, that's a huge um, alteration in the zeitgeist well, that is not undertaken have to, have or understood by the institutions we've inherited out of history. You have you to understand. take this a step further. We've okay. quadrupled the population or, or trebled the population since then as well. Well, all right, but he's taking that into account. He may have been off, but the, the concept, the idea, it is leading because he would say we were and have in our time transcended in our capability scarcity. Yes, we have. And that we did not have institutions, but that we do not have institutional assumptions growing out of a historical context, 200,000 years of scarcity. The situation has changed, and w the institutions we've inherited, including economic theory, does not make it possible for us to take advantage of what the zeitgeist either allows now in a new liberating kind of way, or requires if we're not to, in a certain sense, as many people see, the other thing that happened in 1970 is our weapon systems finally got to the point where they could eliminate the whole species. Well, I'm glad you brought up the Soviet Union. Well, and it wasn't only the Soviet Union. We had a lot of mi missiles ourselves. Uh, we probably had more in 1970. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's about the time when they, they, they will tell us from models that we did have weapon systems that if they're unleashed, unlike the Second World War as recent, they would have meant, apparently, the end of the whole species, 
existentially something's going on in the evolution of things in the universe and do our leaders or our visionary leaders or our leaders or our intellectual leaders take account of those kind of major changes in any kind of way and does it impact economic I, or Harold, I, I'd economic hate to, theory? I'd hate to think we were lemmings. Uh -huh. uh, okay. and, and, and what you're talking about is the population of the lemmings grows so large in Norway that they have to run off the cliff uh, and kill themselves. But uh, no, not really. are we growing so fast, so wealthy, absorbing so many supplies that serendipitously we've developed nuclear weapons to limit our population? No, it's just the thing that, or no, it's not a limiting of population in the case now. That was the limiting, Genghis Khan limited the population. <laughs> Yes. And and the and the various wars that have been fought, bombing of Dresden did that. That kind of thing we've done that, but it's reached a point where, in a systems way, that uh, the population is going to level off at about 10 billion around 2020. The UN's telling us now, and that kind of thing. But it, yeah. it 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 is that there's something different about the time in which we live than in all of human history, and that we're coming to a new kind of a situation I that be, should be given some attention by our intellectual leaders, yeah, and it's not. Let's touch on this for a second. Okay, I, see, I see two reasons for population being relatively limited. Uh, one is dreadful poverty, where you have lots of children, and they die, and you have a very low life expectancy, and the population needs lots of kids to stay stable. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, agricultural and, life. And, yeah. and in fact, it's a fragile, humanity's pretty fragile mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, as an example, the, the Black Plague. Uh, it, yeah. took, it took 600 years for the British working man's wages to equal the equivalent of what they'd risen to after the Black Plague. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, so many workers were killed mm -hmm. that, that yeah. it wasn't until the 19th century that the British worker caught up with uh, the post-plague salaries. Yeah. However, the other way that, back on, on track of what, what limits the population, the other thing that limits the population is wealth. Mm -hmm. Wealthier societies have fewer children, mm -hmm. for whatever the reasons. And Industrialization, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. now, it's not a question of industrialization, okay. it's a question of wealth. Okay. And, and it's wealthier societies, so mm -hmm. a sub-society within the greater society has fewer children. For yeah. example, let's take the French before the French Revolution. The mm -hmm. French lords had a very low reproductive rate. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the, the, Briti uh, I'm sorry, the Roman senatorial and equestrian class during the time of Augustus mm -hmm. were negative rate. Mm -hmm. Remember, Augustus had to not only offer economic incentives to have children, but he offered threats for yeah. not having children. Mm -hmm. uh, this, so throw it back to the modern age where we have more and more people achieving not just longevity and a lower death rate, but actual middle class levels of wealth. Mm -hmm. They stop having children. Uh, why, perhaps? Why? My guess is, and it's purely uh, an Edmundism. Uh, uh, Edmundism, I, I like the term. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> I have Makes lots. Makes me think of Mr. Gibbon. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was a tenth as bright as he was. Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, numbers of numbers of reasons, but but one, they no longer need children to survive. Mm -hmm. Uh, children become a luxury rather than a necessity. I once had a, I, well, I don't know if you're familiar with Jay Forrester and the, uh, the intellectual force behind the Club of Rome and so forth, and all of that study, and I once did, he was a very serious systems analysis person I in economics. So. I'm embarrassed, uh, considering my, my former mother-in-law was the EU ambassador. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I had a conversation with him along the lines that I'm having with you 25 years ago or 20 years ago or so, and it brought up the, th the thesis that Mr. Fuller advanced. He was a polymath, comprehensivist. And uh, I, I put that forth to him, and he would not bring it up on, camp on camera, but he understood exactly what I was saying. And it was essentially, I was saying, that we may be transcending scarcity systems-wide, everybody, okay? And that we could transcend scarcity, there's another component to that about the labor input to production. It was the labor theory of value, the question of that. But anyway, but he said that, and he essentially said to me, and I'm going to put it on camera, the man's past and so forth, but he, he, said, he said, you can never have scarcity 
a non-scarcity as a reality or satisfaction because the reason that the people who are in that position you're talking about do not have the children is uh, it's essentially, in the modern experience, it's essentially that they would, ri they're, they're on the fast track, they're growing, they're doing what they have to do to be genteel and bourgeois and even upper middle class and all those kind of things, and that they would, it's a matter, of, they would really rather have a Buick instead of just a mere Ford than a baby. And it's a sense, essentially, uh, that they're alien. So you're saying they'll never be happy. Well, it, no, it would be that they c you could never have non-scarcity, or you could never have that. And they, they're essentially in an alienated state in terms of human values and so forth. And that they 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 could have a b they really want the baby. They want the Buick. They want the material. They thing. always want they the got next. A, they want the next model. They're section. They're essentially alienated. And you got to keep the little. You got to keep them alienated. This is from a systems looking at things, godlike kind of thing, that you have to keep them alienated. Uh, you can never have a population of the world that is non-scarce and non-alienated because if they did, then having babies would be a really nice thing, and they would breed us off the planet. But it's a mark of alienation that they want to have a Buick rather than a baby, and babies are really nice things. That was advanced, off camera, we wouldn't say it on camera. Interesting, interesting thought. So yeah. that the, the modern mind is not a thing other than, and the, the, the uppie, the upper it mobile, that kind of stuff, is really an alienated state of consciousness. It comes to the same premise I have, okay. nonetheless. You think, yeah? Uh, by golly, it's human nature to want comfort, physical comfort and okay. security. Uh -huh. uh, it's also human nature to show off. Uh, you know, we, we don't have feathers now, so we use jewelry and cars. Yes. Uh, you know, as an aside, it's interesting to note that India now has a quarter billion people in the middle class. Yeah, they've also got 800 million that are on less than a dollar a day. That's true. And they got 800, they, and they've got eight, 80,000 demonstrations in that country called that's Communist China. That's true, secret ones. And Mr. Stiglitz tells us that the lot of the 80% of the population, the way things are now set up, are not being and will not be served well by the methods of uh, the models of growth and so forth that the neocons and other people would project. I mean, that's <sighs> just al alternate data. But it is. We don't yeah. know that. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you think about it, uh, that's, that's 200 million people entered the middle class since 1970 in, in India. It's measured by, okay, yeah. You yeah. know, so where they only had two or three or four percent the ruling class in India, or the 10% you talk about, mm -hmm. uh, now perhaps they're at 25%. They have a long way to go. Mm. Uh, and you're right, it's going to be difficult to achieve that next level, which I think is what led you to invite me here in the first place. Well, I wanted to talk about other things. I mean, these things interest me a great deal and everything. And uh, one of the things is we had a great interesting, uh, along about 8 in the morning yes. on Social Security, if I'm not mistaken. We had a uh, well, rock and roll in the background. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, Started as a conversation it, on rock and roll. It did, and about the, uh, about the, uh, you know, the e economics. Because another aspect of it is the, the this labor theory of value. And uh, Mr. Kelso, somebody I repair to, is that essentially it doesn't really matter in a certain sense in terms of looking at economics now. Uh, uh, th you got that larger ontologic picture of we are perhaps in our capability transcending scarcity as an ontologic reality after 200,000 years. Uh, so the material things, uh, anyway, but the other thing is this labor theory of value. And from Adam Smith to Ricardo to Marx to Schumpeter to Keynes, Van Hayek, all of these, they all are essentially based upon the labor theory of value. Yes. And uh, the basic organizing principle for the American economy still is the Employment Act of 1946. And we have a situation where the vast amount of income distributed to the people within our economy, with the economy of the world, is done in a way in which people have a claim upon production is uh, through their having a labor relationship to production, and in the ontologic reality, increasingly, particularly in the American economy, the actual input to production, if you put labor on one side, all intellectual and physical input to the productive process, in realistic terms, it's probably only about 10% of the actual production is labor. 
and yet we distribute all income through labor standards the marks come and the capital assets and the technology and everything else other than labor is owned by a tiny small plutocratic class who sets the template and then the marxists call that wage slavery and it seems to be accepted and this idea of the labor theory of value seems to be a grounding principle of all economic theory with the possible exception in my way of thinking and set me straight or maybe this Mr. Kelso and Mr. Mortimer Adler wrote a book called The Capitalist Manifesto that brought it into question. Muammar Gaddafi in the country of Libya has brought it into question. But is it correct in your thinking from a theoretical understanding that all economic theory is I informed by a labor theory of value and value is added by human activity, either intellectual or physical? <sighs> and that uh, technology is essentially congealed labor? or stolen, as the Marxists would have called I it? I wouldn't say that. I'd okay. say, I'd say uh, it's another form of labor, not stolen. And you have to give, call that intellectual labor. Could you uh, call it, uh, OK, Are you, uh, uh, could you call them capital workers? It's a, nice, it's a nice sounding term. It's uh, the one you Lewis used in order to get past the yeah. idea. People are so imposed. You know, because you're not supposed to get anything for nothing. If you own a piece of uh, technology that turns out a bunch of shoes and you own it, you get income coming to you but not doing anything. Sure. And that's uh, the way most, most income is financed internally. If you own internally. it, but how did you own it? So we have to start to think back. Instead of thinking of individuals, think of families, in, the, in which case their family at some point did do something. Usually they were, did something that was beyond the law. They well, that's, some that's high, easy to say. Highwayman kind of thing, you know, my, smuggling my, booze or something. My, my brother-in-law uh, just took over as president of a company that mm -hmm. does logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, the owner's grandfather uh, founded the company with two trucks, mm -hmm. and it now does $300 million a year. Thank you, Mr. Shumpeter. Creative entrepreneurialism. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And Chum Peters got to have a say along with Mr. Friedman in terms of what yes informs our system of thinking currently. He hasn't been popular in my lifetime. He has a been hasn't been as popular in my life as he is now. Yeah. And do you think he and Friedman, <sighs> Van Hayek maybe? No. Van well, Mises. Van Hayek. Gosh, I haven't I haven't read much about him in, since college, mm -hmm. a long time. Okay. Uh, but it's yeah, uh, it's, it's it's capital. It's it's the it's the intellect or hard work. Uh, NBC, I'm sorry, uh, the the accursed Fox News. Yeah. Ha <laughs> brought on a uh, construction worker type mm -hmm. on TV uh, yesterday or the day before, mm. and he was talking about how he'd achieved millionaire status. Uh -huh. he, he, he said, uh, you work really hard, you get up in the morning and you work really late and you save as much as you can and you put it back into the business and you work really hard. And he said, now, I was never much of a reader and I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know a lot of books, but uh -huh. now I'm a millionaire. And uh -huh. this guy clearly uh -huh. was not an intellectual. Uh -huh. yeah, no, he but did, uh, yeah. he was a successful people. Right. I also uh -huh. know uh -huh. When I was a stockbroker, prior mm -hmm. to my getting involved with the high-tech kids, yeah, uh -huh. uh, some of my wealthiest clients were plumber, plumbing contractors. Right. Regardless uh -huh. of race or, or religion, they were just guys who rolled up their sleeves right. and then figured out that they should hire a couple of more people to roll up their sleeves with them. Uh -huh. And uh, sure, they took a part of the earnings these people made, but uh -huh. uh, they created real businesses and became yeah. wealthy. Uh -huh. Uh, there are some people who done. Mr. Gates did pretty well. That he guy did, that dropped out of college. He did darn well. <laughs> uh, luckily, he had a business and a millionaire father to fall back on. Well, that's always nice. Uh, that does help. I you know, think. nothing beats brains, mm -hmm. but having a, a little uh, inheritance helps. Usually it does. I think that's uh, you know, George Gilder notwithstanding with his wealth and power. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. That, you know, that's one reason I wanted you to think families rather than individuals. Okay, households maybe? Yeah. Or no, families uh, in a dynastic sense. In a sense, dynastic yeah. sense. Yeah, 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 now, yeah. now mm. both to the good and the bad. Oh. You know, we could use my family, which has managed to steadily decrease uh -huh. its net assets. Actually, it changes in every two or three generations. It does, yeah. Uh, it, it certainly 
can remove some hubris mm -hmm. if you look at it that way. Mm -hmm. You can see that some families are doing well now and won't later. Uh, however, you were talking about the fellow that inherited the factory. I wasn't really. I was trying to talk at a theoretical level about the input mix to production through time. And that, that's what I'm thinking about, really. Because in Tom Jefferson's day, it was probably, in, according to Lewis Kelso, Mortimer Adler, our preeminent philosopher, they were bringing this up in a book called The Capitalist Manifesto, which I think is really progressively threatening to the system, and yet it's called the Capitalist Manifesto, in the best sense of the word, uh, a challenge to it, more, much more so than Marx, which is all over the place and everything. But they had this thing, and they, they said that in Tom Jefferson's day, the, the, you have, let's say you take labor, all human activity, intellectual and physical, on the one side of an equation, and the other you take everything else. You take land, structures, capital and tangibles, patent rights, all other things on the other side of the equation. And in Tom Jefferson's day, in fact, I, if you don't mind, please maybe just show this because this is a chart there would be, and it's it's maybe even bring it on the camera here, and you could take a look at it and you say what you think. And if you could come in close on this, George, if you could, this is a chart. Maybe people have seen it before. This is from Lewis Kelso, Mortimer Adler, and they're looking at the American economy and they're trying to measure two things between on this one side is is. Uh, labor's contribution, this is the one side, labor's contribution, this is Tom, over here is Tom Jefferson's time, 1776, Adam Smith, the Enlightenment, Hume, and so forth, and that the input to production by something other than labor was probably not much more than about 10%. No mass production, there was nothing like that. A man had a hammer, he built it 12 hours it. to make a pair of boots, and that the trend, in the, this is the American economy, but it's representative of the world trend, is for this to go up so that the input, the actual input to production is less and less human activity, intellectual or physical, yeah. and you get up here, and you, I'm over in the wrong page, up here, and now it's, pr you get every, over here to the present, it's probably not more human activity, intellectual and physical, all the hard work and all that kind of thing, is probably not more than about 10%, and yet all of the income is distributed to the people except for the few who own this, 90, keep it on the chart please George, the 90%, the capital assets are all owned by a tiny class of people who get overwhelmingly more wealthy all the time and the more, most important, part, their, contri their contribution as owners of that capital uh, uh, capability to producing the combine with no driver. You know, I, I sort of agree with you, and, 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 and much as No, but if the, th is this something that does make sense and has a trend that's important to the world? And if so, how are we going to address this problem we want to get talking about Social Security? We do. Uh, part of it, I think, is that it's not really the, the ratios you, that, that Mr. Kelso shows are probably off but that there's still okay. there's still some accuracy to it. Yeah, this is a pattern. Yeah. The one now looks for. the the, and the, the thing that's the thing that's hurting and and maintaining this pattern in my mind is the inheritance tax. And uh, because the very wealthy, the inheritance tax is a joke. Mm. Uh, I, I made a living for part of my career helping very rich people avoid paying any. Oh, they got great lawyers to help uh, them do that. And, and consultants. And it's a global world. They yeah, can just right. park their money offshore. Uh, yeah, they can do Cayman Islands all over the place and everything. It's easy to do. Yeah. And uh, even if they pay a few hundred million on, on several billion, what's yeah. the big deal? Yeah, the, but they, yeah, if I, it, they yeah. Main th this allows generational growth to take place. Yeah, that's the massive. thing on the individual base. This is a, a, an idea of the uh, the actual evolution yeah. of the means of production. But has changed but fundamentally. It, 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 it bigger pie, more and more technological. It's a bigger and more pie. More and more concentrated. It's uh, yes, and the way it's the reason it's more concentrated is the middle class on a generational basis is prevented from accumulating wealth. Well, they, they do, and our system, I and actually there are people who, th there are ads taken out that if you do not work, if you get, it's called unearned income. If you have some yeah, capital assets, it's going to, if you got some capital, you, you make a, a cotton picking machine 
that can pick cotton and you don't have to pick the cotton somebody owns the machine and the year after they set up the cotton picking machine or they start a nobel peace committee and cotton picking because the labor idea idea of labor putting your hard work into it that kind of there's all kinds of identity and ethics and things wiped up in that but it's the machine that's producing it and the machine is all owned by a small group of people call it a big black box that is something other than labor and it's owned by some and they're getting overwhelmingly wealthy and we're still distributing income to well, the masses of people through labor well it's not and they're only contributing 10 percent it's not just labor the capitalists are being ripped off in terms of their input to production the capital uh, owners well no you don't think so? I, I, I think that the... It, uh, it goes down to about 22% you know, they get back on their well, return the, of what the problem capital is, should. The problem is, I think Mr. Kelso's theory might be in the right direction, but I think his numbers are really skewed. Oh, well. Okay. And, 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 and you have to still acknowledge that uh, part of the, the joy of the wealthy is to use the wealth, so they have to buy things with it. Yeah, part but they, the they get to where they can't do it. They have to invest. They can only buy and so much. And so that makes more things, and they hire more workers. There's still workers making things. There's still workers distributing. Less and less. No. Less and less. They can go to the vanishing point. Well, you can point. point to the chart, but a chart's mm -hmm. just a drawing. Yeah. Okay, uh, right. You're you right. Know, in, in, in fact... Well, it's uh, in this, doesn't it reflect reality? <sighs> you know, the economy is so fungible so and flat and... and, 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 and this doesn't mean I uh, let me start with the premise I think that to a degree the wealthy have structured it so that the middle class have a very tough time entering their ranks at the same time we have seen constant turmoil in the economy with the new widgets being invented mm -hmm. and the new cell phone and the Gates's of the world you know Gates if he was like a normal rich man's son would now be worth five or ten million dollars mm -hmm. not 50, 70 billion dollars. Really? Why? Uh, what do you Why? Mean because he would have taken the money, would have husbanded, he would have probably, s his father was a physician or something? I'm not sure. His father was, you know, good, solid, upper middle class, mm -hmm. uh, not terrifically wealthy, mm -hmm. and he would have stayed, you know, in roughly that social level, maybe raised it a little bit, uh, like most of us do. He was entrepreneurial. He was beyond entrepreneurial. Yeah. I mean, this is on the steroids. On steroids. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, there are also plenty of people that do it and fail, uh, succeed well, for a while and fail. The real entrepreneurs is rare as Toscanini. Uh, no. Successful entrepreneurs. That's that's better. That's what I meant. You know, let's say there are a lot more Salieri's than Mozart. Uh -huh. Though Salieri, <laughs> yes. was a, Salieri was a pretty talented, pretty uh, good, yeah, uh, yeah, but just not the best. Not, not, not uh, that many Michelangelo's or Tiger Woods. No, mm -hmm. but but yeah. you know what? <sighs> there are a lot of people at their footsteps, mm -hmm. just following behind. But that that said and done, wealth is constantly changing. Uh, It's so complicated. It, 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 it's well, hard uh, to follow. Trying to get above the complication to okay. get patterns. Because if you get and into I the details, you can get all the way down. And if I would suggest that this is something that is being suggested The problem as a pattern, is the bottom 10% of the economy this year is not going to be the same people 10 years hence. Well, things are churning. And, 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 and some of that bottom 10% might wind up in the top 5%. For all, for all we see. What I'm suggesting is the zeitgeist has changed all in a very significant kind of way, in a paradigm way. And I'm suggesting that our intellectual and political uh, leadership has not come up with a vision in keeping with what the zeitgeist. It's like when Copernicus said we went around, uh, you know, the, the Earth went around the sun. It ri Hieronymus Bosch, it really messed up people's sense of identity and so forth that we're coming into a situation that all of our institutions were predicated within a certain context, changed in 1970 or thereabouts, yeah. and we do not have an alternative, and we're trying to justify and work with systems that are outdated, oh. one of which is the way in which uh, we're coming up against the dilemma because all the money that went into Social Security retirement funds came out of money, income, labor uh, payments to people, and those are now being eroded, and we have a problem with the right. continuation of Social Security and because we're locked up in a labor theory of value, and we distribute all income to labor, 
when there should be a uh, distribution of ownership of the technology that's producing the wealth to everybody. Exactly. And that we need a major change, and our leaders don't come up with well, it. All they, they do is say, our let's leader, get everybody employed. President Bush tried to come up with it and was he slammed tried. down. Yeah, but he was, and it uh, wasn't able to manifest. It wasn't able to manifest it. Uh, and that brings us to a really critical point. We're at a point in society now where the where the working class, whether they're middle class or not, mm -hmm. can achieve real wealth over, um, over multi-generations. Well, wait a minute. I, okay, I, I hear you saying that. I come from Detroit. My father was a grand, my grandfather was a labor organizer, dad a lawyer and all that, but it's going differently. Things are going differently on a world scale. A lot of people say it's a race to the bottom. And those people that own the assets that are actually creating the wealth, are getting overwhelmingly wealthy, right. and it's becoming, it's more concentrated wealth in the United States of America now than it was in uh, 19, 1789 France. Well, ex yes, but at the same time, the two wealthiest men on the planet, Bill Gates and, and, and Warren Buffett. Amount to about 50% of the population, I think. Uh, no, or Gates. No, Bill, did I say Warren? Warren you brought him Warren Bill Buffett. Gates and he Warren just Buffett. He gave it all to Gates. Uh, well, what he did was, he gave his estate to Gates' charity. Yeah, to his charity. Uh, yeah. I believe it's 35 billion. Gates has already given away 35 billion. Mm -hmm. Still has another 100 or so behind that, right. uh, 70 to 100. Yeah. However, that's they're both new money, uh -huh. relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett's father was a doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's right. There's, there's value. Yahoo's and, starting. And by the way, real. Warren Buffett's the richest man in the world, but uh, my first boss as a stockbroker's father was in partner was was in Warren Buffett's first partnership. Really? Yeah. And he declined to go into the second partnership in 1972. Bad idea. It was called Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, indeed. Ten dollars a share. Mm -hmm. How much are they now? I have no idea. I don't follow it at all. Eight hundred thousand? Uh, is that really? That's really some sort I of. I don't know. It's a, in a the differential. Of, yeah. It's in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. But but uh, but you 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 think we're going to be able to go through? No, it's 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 a, I'm losing we're my mind. It's about eighty-seven thousand. Whatever. But we're going to be. I'm talking. I'm trying to get a, sort of above that of the to the pattern. Yeah. And that we're going to be able to. We have a we have a technological capability. We agreed, perhaps. Yes. I'm not sure if we did that. We could, with weapons. They're just starting a new system of. Uh, you got a lot of angst in the world. We went into Iraq, and now we got a world that is very much in very serious opposition to us. There's opposition to us. The New York Times famously said, "There is the superpower, the hyperpower, of the United States." I would, you know, and yep. he says, "Then there's world opinion, which is against increasingly the a the, the 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 perceived notion of the United States oh. as not having a vision, and there's an, a, a growing against that, and they're making weapon systems that uh, are able to destroy the species." And they don't have a vision that's going to be able to be in tune with what the zeitgeist requires, what I'm suggesting. Okay. There are fewer powers now than in 1972 capable of destroying the entire planet. The Soviet Union probably is, lo the Russia probably has lost that capability. Mm -hmm. uh, China doesn't have it, though China, interestingly, yesterday uh, proved it can now shoot down satellites. Mm -hmm. they, they, they no, did. it's getting there. North Korea, no, Pakistan, no. India. But these they do are it, all they, they've got an off balance there. And the United States. Yeah, the United States ultimately be, might be the one that unleashes it. It might. You think everything's okay because the United States is in total control, Rome on the Potomac? I mean, a lot of the people are objecting to that because the United States... Better, better Rome than Athens. Well, but perhaps. Uh, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, but they don't, they don't have a vision that is required, and it, it comes to manifest. They weren't able to bring a vision to that because they they got a system that they're going to safeguard I, I, the wealthy rather than have a system that's going to irrigate the masses, including the ecology you know, and everything else. I have a problem. I'm not sure the wealthy even realize they're conspiring against everyone else. I don't think it's a conspiracy, it's just keeping power. Uh, well, it's, it's not even that. I think they genuinely believe that paying out all of the Social Security is for the benefit of the workers, when in reality it betrays them. Mm. I think they just don't think. I think frequently it's good men doing dumb things, not I bad so. things, just yeah. dumb things. Uh, okay, could be. Not bad. I don't think it's bad. I, I'm saying that we collectively do, do not have right. a vision that the evolving realities 
require or allow that's in the new kind of liberation. Absolutely. We have a now, capability now before that we, we before can't Before we realize. talk about making... And it's economic theory that's the problem. But here's the one little part we have to keep in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is a little whimsical, but remember some of the people with the grandest theories included... Stalin? Uh, Napoleon, <laughs> Stalin, <laughs> Hitler. Genghis Khan. Khan probably yeah. just wanted to get another date. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, but certainly Julius Caesar. Another, who, uh, Khan? Oh, just conquer. Genghis get a few, Khan? Get a few met? thousand more Khan. Con no, oh. get a few thousand more concubines. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, he did leave his mark. He, he did, and yeah. Tamerlane was uh, another goodie. Yeah, right. Uh, let's see how big a tent, or how big a castle we can build of skulls. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Right. But no, those two accepted the the uh, certainly some of the great, uh, greatest, most ruthless, horrible people uh, had great broad theories that they tried to implement uh, um, at the expense of individuals. Perhaps so. Yeah, I don't know. The, wor and the broad theories haven't had much to do until we really got serious with industrialization after after. Well, no, no, no. Hume uh, and that Napole Scottish Nap Enlightenment. Napoleon. God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we met when I wore a kilt. Yes, that's right. Uh, Have you seen the book, if I could? It was chance. written by Herman, serious, in, uh, serious intellectual, a historian, <sighs> wrote the book How the Scots Invented the Modern World and Everything in It. It was the Scottish Enlightenment more than the French, and it was Adam Smith, and it was the steam engine, and it was that. 60% of the signers of the, Const uh, the uh, Declaration of the Institute and all of the, the United Masons. States were Scots. It was the Scots who created this modern world, and yep. we're both Scots. It's true. So it's us that they can blame for plus this modern world if you've got a, the Masons with who it. brought the Enlightenment uh, or, or the leadership of the Enlightenment were Scots. But it was it's the American system that's in place, and they yep. claim historical legitimacy. My contention is that the system International monetary, the system that's in place is nothing, is really an enjant regime. The way the uh, Louis the Sixteenth was yeah. an enjant regime for a system that's been bypassed and they don't okay. have leadership. That's and a very we need leadership to come forth. And, we're th and it's all predicated essentially upon your field, economic theory, yeah. because it's the economic theory that's out of sync. That's what I'm suggesting. I, I, you I gotta would spread some ownership to I the folks and you gotta have real democracy and relate them to the way things are actually being produced. And it doesn't require human input to production. You can't distribute income through labor. No, but you can distribute capital to labor. You don't do that. It's all concentrated totally at the top. Which Paul, is why we have to change the Social Security system. I agree with you. That's what we wanted to talk about. And I wanted to ask you about that because you have an understanding which I don't. We have a lot of financial. You're a financial person. You understand the finance. We have financial instruments. Yes. We have stocks and we have bonds. And we have all kinds of financial interests. I mean, I instruments and so forth by which ownership the can be uh, well, uh, obtained. The, the only way to obtain ownership is through ownership. Owning debt does not give you ownership. Well, wait, uh, if I may. Unless. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It gives you some power for a time. Uh huh. But owning. Oh, in successful ownership, you can always buy out the debt. Okay. In, in the corporate world, if a company uh, gets really rich, they pay off. There's always something written in there uh, to allow them to buy the debt back. Uh, uh, practically all growth is financed by internal uh, retained earnings. No. Uh, all, uh, most initial Oh, initial, that's it. But I mean the, growth, the ongoing thing, it's internal. Yeah. Uh, but but the, way to, the way to get wealth is to own wealth and to, is to distribute wealth. The best way to get to, to be able to get wealth is you to know, be born into wealth. Well, one thing that has stemmed some of the flow, or the, the continuance of the ancient regime, mm -hmm. has been the social, uh, has been the pension system, mm -hmm. which sadly is not universal in this country, but uh -huh. is very broad, and a huge percentage of the wealth in this country is owned by pension funds. Absolutely, funds. and that's owned by people like you and me. Okay. It's because because there are limits on what percentage of your income at a certain uh, above certain levels mm -hmm. levels can go in and there are also caps on how much can be paid into pensions okay this is what i wanted to get from you if i could 
Uh, we have various instruments. Some of them are government. Some of them are private sector. They're various instruments. We have uh, T-bills. We have government bonds. We have, uh, we have government organizations, and there are responsibilities. Some of those investment uh, p uh, property, or some of those investments are, um, are, are more risky than others, let's say. Yeah. Does Social Security Shall I give us a, a nutshell of risk? Okay, uh, sure. Let's try, I'll try to do it we in got about minutes. ten minutes left, so let's get this For in. The we hour? want to take care of oh Social my. Security within about the next eight minutes. Uh, in that case, uh, let's say that the ability to be liquid is the arbiter of risk, and if a T-bill, which by definition lasts a year, is uh, the least risky because it's very short term and you're mm -hmm. guaranteed your money back. Oh. A note, which is a maximum of five years, uh, guarantees your money back in five years. It has the least fluctuation again and risk because it, it doesn't have long to go. You obtain more risk in debt instruments like bonds mm -hmm. uh, the longer you go because in between maturity, things like inflation can happen. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, that's a risk you're taking and that can factor the value of a debt instrument dramatically as it did in your lifetime and oh, mine. Yeah. Uh, now, the real risk is in equity, mm -hmm. and equity is state ownership. Right. There's mm -hmm. two types of equity, preferred and, and, and common. Mm -hmm. And uh, preferred is really a higher paying form of debt with very modest ownership mm -hmm. uh, attached to it. Mm -hmm. So the real ownership is straight old common stock mm -hmm. or pure debt. And there you have uh, the ability to lose it all. Okay. Now, now, that said, you have the ability to make most of the money. Yeah, that's right. And that could go into venture and get even now, more hedge funds. Or historically, mm -hmm. over, over any given 20-year period, mm -hmm. stocks have done about 11%. And bonds have done eleven percent. What annual? Not yeah, annual. annual. That much? Yeah. That fast? Yeah. So you're over okay. twenty year periods. Twenty year period. And over on an average? Yeah. That's pretty high. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And and debt has done about uh, six seven percent. Okay. Well, the, now uh, yeah. now uh, most people don't put their their all their eggs in one basket when they invest. They yeah. they mix it so. I like to talk about a meld, and, and for the rest of the chat, we'll talk about portfolio. a diversified portfolio that includes some debt for stability's yeah. sake, yeah. and you know that gives you the protection on the short term if uh -huh. you need the, to gain access to the money, and for the long term growth equity. So, let's talk combined rate of return of eight percent. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to ask you about, that's all very interesting, particularly from the standpoint of a practical use and the thinking of the thing. But it's going to come later when we talk Social we Security. We only got a couple of minutes. The Social Security thing, you, you people uh, were paid money and they paid money, FDIC, or as they call it, was it that, that they paid to ta from their, ta they paid into the trust fund. They have a trust fund, a huge trust fund, supposedly good for th up to the 30 or something. That trust fund, is it, uh, and you have, you have a government uh, paper, you have, it is not sitting in a, in a passport paving, it's invested somehow or something. And it must be a very limited, uh, very uh, limited risk in terms of the investments that the trust fund is in order to realize Yeah, that. It's, it's in government debt and it's being paid so little that its actual return is negative uh, over the long term. Is it really negative? It uh, need be. It now, the question is, is it possible to get it to where the instruments that are support you take Social Security, successful, in terms of alleviating a lot of suffering and so forth, right. it's working. But it's, it's been taking people, young people's money and transferring it no, to older No, because you got to transfer, you only got three people paying now, you had more and all that kind of thing. But the thing is, but the imp if it's true, the input to production is less and less labor. All of the money that came was distributed by labor criteria. We're looking to a fortune where that's not going to work. Is there going to have to be some way of having yeah, a different, uh, an expansion? Take Social Security instead of doing away with it, but that you take the tweak Social it Security, and change it. Well, you take it and you uh, uh, you you up the level of risk ladder that could be made available to properties yes. that are going to be secure for the people because if it's for the security, you don't want the people who are trying to make a killing uh, or take a loss. You make the risk and make it so that there are right. instruments that are higher and higher into that risk level so you can you make more You start more giving the individuals in that And then distribute income to the people by ownership of viable stock, ownership correct. of a correction of gradually, a technologically. Gradually privatizing the accounts. 
Yeah. Uh, no, not private. Not, okay, go ahead. By, it's by, still Social Security. It's still Social Security. It's still it's heavily, government. still government regulated totally. But they can go into but more risky can, things by making it less risky. Right. In by, other words. By government policy. By government policy allowing them to put a portion. Now, the president's plan was to allow a portion of the uh, contributions to go into a privatized set of funds much like TIAA CREF, which is the teacher's pension, or the pension the Congress uses. It's, uh, these are a series of mutual funds mm -hmm. that really are buying indexes of the market mm -hmm. and fixed income. Mm -hmm. So it's relatively safe, and I think it's safe to say the, oh, the expenses on running them are minimal. Nobody's going to get rich running those types of funds. And also, the return is going to be mediocre. It's going to be around 8% or 7.5%. Annual? Annual. That's well, what do you mean? That's a huge return. Well, is it's only a huge... Is that reflecting growth rate, or you take... You that's have to that's take the merged growth rate I'm uh, talking about. Uh -huh. And I'm assuming, let's say 7... Well, 8's, eight's a fair percent, because okay. if, you're, if we're buying indexes mm. and we're buying... Uh, straight bonds, mm. uh, there's no need for ma for much of a management fee. So we're mm. talking 10 basis yeah, points okay. uh, for management mm. fee, not the 2 to 3 percent that's being taken by mutual yeah. funds today. Now, that said, mm -hmm. the Heritage Foundation yeah. uh, did a report. Very conservative organization. It is. The most conservative, perhaps, think tank in the country. It is, except they're radical in this area. Mm -hmm. And their radical is to partially privatize uh, Social Security. And they showed that taking someone born in, in the 60s mm -hmm. and let them start contributing now mm -hmm. half of their money into the privatized plan. Mm -hmm. And if they only live to 84, mm -hmm. uh, which as I approach uh, mid-50s sure. seems, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they only live to 84, uh, could leave an estate as high as $230,000. And they, they propose that this is this money not be rolled into Social Security, but rather go to the heirs. Mm. Now, I played with numbers this morning that mm. showed that if we then went to 100 percent privatization for the next generous generation, that uh, states, by the time they're ready to retire, could be worth four to five million dollars. How are the people going to pay into that? We, we've only Same way they're paying into it now. Well, they're paying into it out of labor, co uh, out of wages. Right. Taxes. Right. That system is not going to work much longer. If you're just taking the taxes out mm -hmm. and you're letting you it... you got to run the credits. Yeah, they are. Okay. And, and this is only the beginning. We're going to have to do more. But, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's a huge subject. It's yeah. a huge subject. Oh. Uh, it, it, it can be changed. And mm -hmm. perhaps we can discuss that at another time. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, but uh, you can absolutely ensure that down the road, the workers become millionaires. Well, uh, you've got to assure that the workers have an alternative way of getting money other than their work. And that's by and giving it, them and the equity. And you cannot rely upon past savings. And the logic of business finance is you make an investment you rely that pays on future for itself savings. out of its future earnings. You got to spend that. That's the logic that's of business finance. That's called investing. Finance. That's called investing. If it's a bad investment, you lose. You got to extend that to everybody, and you got to make that less risky. And that's what the Heritage Foundation and President Bush. Well, I would to like do. to investigate that because I can't. I, I really think that has to be investigated carefully.